Thank you, Seth. I think uh, those of you who have been uh, going through the Gospel of John with us uh, for the past, what, year and a half, two years, we're wondering where we're going next. Well, I'm taking a psalm, obviously, this Sunday and next Sunday. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to begin a study in the book of Ephesians. So that's where we're going. Spend some time in uh, that glorious book. But I like to do a few psalms in between series. And so tonight, this morning it's Psalm 93 and next week it'll be Psalm 94. So let me read our psalm. And then let me, but let me also elaborate a little bit on Seth's last announcement about the uh, next week. It's going to be an abbreviated Lord's Supper, so about 10 minutes in length. We'll, uh, one of the elders will begin it and give thanks for the bread and thanks for the cup. And then after that, we will dismiss for the luncheon. Uh, that way, we'll be able to do it on time. So that'll be the schedule next week. But let's look at Psalm 93. The Lord reigns, He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded Himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established, it will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their pounding waves more than the sounds of many waters than the mighty breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's I suppose there have always been prophets of doom, but the modern world has had its share of them. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there was the British economist Thomas Malthus, who calculated that the population growth would surpass the Earth's ability to increase the food supply. Unless we controlled the size of the population, there would be unrest, there would be famine and war, a catastrophe. China followed that model in 1980 with its one-child policy and with dire consequences. Today, it's predictions of a climate apocalypse. The UN's environmental boss warned that we have 10 years to stop the catastrophe. That was in 1972. That was later adjusted. An irreversible catastrophe will occur in the year 2000. It was adjusted again, and since then adjusted again. Listen, the apocalypse is coming. Read the book of Revelation. The Lord is going to literally wreck the environment of this world in judgment before Christ returns and establishes His kingdom on the earth, which will be a glorious kingdom. He spoke of that in Matthew 19 and verse 28. He described it as the regeneration. Then the environment will be perfect. That will happen then... For the same reason, the apocalypse is not happening now. The Lord is reigning. Now, I'm not denying that there is climate change or suggesting that we can be reckless. We have a stewardship. People should cultivate the earth and use it reasonably, use its resources well and wisely, not waste not litter, not pollute. We all want clean air and clean water, 
But the idea that man can destroy this world or that an asteroid will collide with the planet and obliterate us like the dinosaurs is contrary to Scripture. In fact, I'd say it is actually pagan. It's a belief in the sovereignty of man or in the reign of impersonal forces like fate or chance. Psalm 93 completely contradicts that and begins with the glorious affirmation that gives the greatest comfort. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded Himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Oh, but the science, someone will say. Just like Thomas Malthus might have said, Oh, but the arithmetic. Numbers and figures and statistics don't lie. No, they don't unless they've been miscalculated or misinterpreted. Look, I'm for science and I'm for statistics. But sometimes I think the phrase, the science, can be a refuge for a weak argument. Science is valuable when it's right, but it's not always right. In fact, it, it, it is always being changed. Uh, would you go to a doctor today who followed the medicine of the 18th century and practiced bleeding, bloodletting, or of the 1950s who does lobotomies? Fortunately, science is always changing. What doesn't change and what is always right and our ultimate authority is Scripture, the Word of God. And it declares here in Psalm 93, on, and, and I should say and on virtually every page of Scripture in one sense or another, that the Lord reigns. And that should give us peace. It will give us perspective on life and, and on the world and help us take the long view on things so we can live confidently in hope when the world seems to be collapsing. What is the background of this psalm? Well, some have explained it as written after the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity. That's possible. Psalm 137 was written during that era, that time. It begins, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept. Upon the willows in the midst of it we hung our harps. They were in despair. It seemed as though all was lost. They were in captivity, and they must have been in, ca in captivity because God had abandoned, had abdicated His throne. Their hope and joy were gone. They couldn't sing songs of Zion. They hung up their harps. Psalm 93 could fit that period, but it, it doesn't reveal the historical context, and it really it fits with any period of history or any situation, but especially an age when the moral order is tottering and crumbling. In such times, it may seem that God is not on His throne, but it only seems that way. It's never true that God is unattached to the events of life. He is always on His throne, and verse 2 states that. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. God's throne is eternal. There was never a time when He was not on His throne. Before time was created, God Almighty was on His throne and will be forever. And He sits enthroned in majesty. That is the first description in verse 1. It means beauty. Beauty that, that garners praise from us. It is splendor like that associated with an imposing monarch like Solomon, whose great throne is described in some detail made of gold 
and ivory with large lions on either side. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom, the writer of First Kings stated. But his house, his house was also filled with opulence. 1,100 gold shields lined the walls of his palace. The queen of Sheba was astonished by the splendor of his court and the wisdom of his rule. The reports that she had heard, she said, didn't tell the half of his wisdom and prosperity. That's majesty. But it is as nothing compared to the majesty of the Lord. Isaiah got a glimpse of it when he was called to be a prophet. It's recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. And he was in the temple there when he saw the Lord exalted on his throne. He was so affected by the sight that he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. He saw himself at that moment in light of the glory of the Lord as a sinner in the pure light of his presence. That is splendor and majesty. John recorded his vision of it in Revelation chapter 4 where he saw the Lord in heaven sitting on the throne. He was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. Both of those stones are red in color. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And from the throne there came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Before the throne is a sea of glass. And 24 elders before the throne are saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. That's majesty. Which suggests that his will cannot be frustrated. That's clearly the point of the next description in our psalm, in verse 1, that he is clothed and girded in strength. When Saul fell on his sword on Mount Gilboa, his son Ishbosheth was uh, king. He succeeded Saul, but he reigned only briefly because he had no power. The Lord reigns with majesty and strength. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He is absolutely sovereign over this world, over the entire universe. He governs everything, and His will is fixed. And so the psalmist can say with certainty, indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. James Boyce interpreted this of God's attribute of immutability, that God does not change. God has a plan for this world and for all of the universe. Man cannot build enough cars or burn enough coal to destroy it. If science and industry can develop cheaper forms of energy, that's good. We're all for that, but the, the fate of the world does not hang on it. God reigns. His will is immutable. His plan is unchangeable. This world is, will not be moved until God moves it. And He will. That's His plan, and that is our hope. All of this majesty and stability is based on the confession of verse 2. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. God, the triune God, is eternal with no beginning or end. That distinguishes Him from everything else. The universe is His creation. We who occupy it are His creation. We have a beginning, we have an end. We are changeable, we are transient, like the grass, like the dew on the grass. He is not. When there was nothing, God was and reigned. 
That's hard for us to understand. That's hard for us to envision. Maybe it's impossible for us to envision. In Psalm 90, Moses wrote, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The world will not be moved because He cannot be moved. Therefore, and this is important, He is reliable. His plan and promises are unfailing. We don't need to fear. Having said all of that, we are living in troubling times. I don't know when the human race since the fall of man has not been living in troubled times, but certainly we are living in troubled times. War has erupted in Israel. But that is just one example of what's always going on. The world is moving, not off its foundation, so to speak, but it's moving on them and in dangerous ways. All is not well in the world. We know that. Of course, the psalmist knew that. He lived in troubling times. That's what he describes next in verses 3 and 4, in which he depicts the world as a, a stormy sea with pounding waves and, and booming noise. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. More than the sounds of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. It's a, it's a description of nature or a description of the nations. There's some ambiguity here, and, and maybe deliberately, because both are true. So I don't see a need to choose between nature and the nations. The Lord is sovereign over both. In Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 27, Paul explains the suffering of the children of God in this present time. It's because we're living in a fallen world due to Adam's sin. It's interesting to me that of all of the Scripture, of all 66 books of the Bible, and any passage, what has really been attacked in modern times is the first three chapters of the Bible. The fall of man and how sin entered into the world. The creation of the world by the Lord God. If we don't understand those first three chapters, we are at sea in regard to what is real and what, what this world is really, what, what it is. It's a creation. God's in control, but something has happened. It's called sin. It's introduced something into this world that God is dealing with that causes all of this disruption. And so Paul is explaining the disruptions that are going on around us and why man is suffering in this time and why there are disruptions. It's due ultimately to Adam's sin. Nothing is as it was intended to be. God's eternal plan is going to fix that. I don't mean that the sin that occurred was outside of His will or His knowledge, but He has a glorious plan for this world and He's going to restore it. But we have this problem, these problems that we see, due to man's fall. And so he begins, Paul does, explaining things from nature that it has been subjected to futility due to Adam. It, is still, it still has order and it reveals the greatness and the glory of God, but, but it never reaches its full potential. Everything runs down. Everything ultimately dies. The fields put forth grass and flowers and wheat, but also weeds and blight. The blessings of sunshine and rain can become the curse of drought and storms. There are famines, floods, and earthquakes. The animal kingdom is filled with beauty and order, but also violence. Tennyson described nature as red in tooth and claw. In the end, everything returns to dust. That is futility. 
But the day will come, Paul says, when creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption and liberated to be what it was originally intended to be when Christ returns and God's sons are glorified. But until then, the world is, is disrupted with natural disasters and the scourges of disease and sickness and plague, which affect us all, Christians and non-Christians alike. Still, God is on His throne. He is ruling over all things by His providence. He creates, sustains, and controls every being, everything, every event, and directs them to His appointed end. And the appointed end ultimately is His glory and our blessing. We can't see the blessings now. Oftentimes, when hardships occur, when accidents happen and jobs are lost, or the economy collapses, we are confused by those kind of events. But that's the, the mystery of providence. All we can do in such times is trust God in spite of the circumstances, in spite of what we see, and be faithful and know that in time, He will make it all plain to us. The Lord reigns. That's what we need to hold on to. That's where our faith is to be. He is ruling the world at every moment, which means we are never in the power of brute forces like fate or chance or luck, but under His wise government, the wise government of the Lord God. So, the floods may lift up their waves and they may pound uh, upon the shore, upon life. Chaos may seem to prevail, but it all happens within the hidden hand of God Almighty according to His all-wise plan for the purpose of blessing. But that extends beyond nature to the nations. The stormy sea, the, the roaring waves and mighty breakers is often used in the prophets of the nations, a, a metaphor to describe them. For example, Isaiah 17 verses 12 and 13 describes the nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. Isaiah 57 verse 20. The wicked are like the tossing sea. Jeremiah 50, verse 42, nations are cruel. Their voice roars like the sea. That's the Gentiles. That's the nations. A, a storm. Always in conflict with one another. Always at war and rebellion. It is history, the, the history of the world. A, a story of constant turmoil hostilities, rapaciousness, greed, and cruelty. There's no peace for the wicked or this world. This too is what the psalmist meant when he wrote of floods and pounding waves. Floods is literally rivers, while pounding waves clearly refers to the sea and... Um, the uh, images that we see in Isaiah. Rivers overflow their banks. The Nile does that annually. So seas and rivers describe nations. The old German commentator Franz Delich interpreted these rivers uh, as uh, specific rivers, the Nile River, the Tigris, and the Euphrates each representing the kingdoms on those rivers. So Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. Those are the, the three great empires of the ancient world that opposed God and oppressed Israel. But not apart from God's sovereign power. That's Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Now remember, he was a young man when he prayed this. He was in Babylon at a crisis because Nebuchadnezzar was unhappy with the um, 
the soothsayers and was having all of the wise men executed. And so Daniel prays, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. It is He who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. When things were chaotic, when it seemed like the end was coming for Him, He's praising the Lord. He's the one who changes the times and the epochs. He creates history. Time and all of the events. He removes kings, and He would remove this great king Nebuchadnezzar in His time. He was confident in the Lord. What he's saying there is the nations rise and fall by God's will and plan. That was true of each of those mighty empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and every kingdom and every country that has ever existed or ever will. He gives them their time and he ends it. He's sovereign over nature and he uses it, he uses nature to achieve his purposes with the nations. When Spain was in its zenith of power and wealth and the Spanish Armada ruled the Atlantic, in 1588 a storm wrecked the fleet and saved England. It was called the Protestant Wind. That began Spain's decline and England's ascendancy. The Lord on high is mighty. That's the confidence of the psalmist in Psalm 93. Every storm of the universe, every atom of the universe, every soul of man is in His hand, and He is directing it all, everything, to His appointed end. But how did he know that? I mean, those are great things to say. But how could I say that with confidence? And how did the psalmist say that with confidence? Well, not because we look at the universe and we come to these conclusions, not because we look at human history and come to these conclusions. If that's what we were limited to, we might gain some sense of the glory of God in it, but we would have despair at the end because everything is constantly failing and coming to nothing. So how is that known? How can he say this with confidence in this psalm? Because God has revealed it. It is all through Scripture. And His revelation is reliable. It is infallible. That's how the psalm ends in verse 5. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. The Lord reigns. His testimonies, His his statements in Scripture, His promises, His prophecies, His commands, teach it. and, And that alone is the ground for our authority. Or rather, His authority and our belief in His authority. He rules over nature and the nations through His providence. He rules over His people through His revelation. His Word is truth. Actually, the psalmist gives three impressive facts about the Lord. His Word is true and reliable. He is holy. He is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And He is eternal. He is forevermore. That literally is for length of days. We mortals cannot comprehend eternity. And so in Scripture, it is usually explained as time without end, length of days, age of ages, that kind of thing. God is forever without beginning or end. So... How should we then live? On the basis of what is revealed in this brief psalm, which is true, which is reliable, how are we to live in a chaotic world? Calmly, confidently, and holy. Holiness befits your house, the psalmist wrote. 
Now, of course, his house at the time the psalm was written was the temple, a rebuilt temple. If this is a post-exilic psalm written after the Jewish nation returned from the Babylonian captivity, it is a rebuilt temple. And so, I should say, if so, the instruction here to keep it holy had special meaning when the psalm was written. Since one of the scandals that caused the, the nation's captivity was the desecration of the temple. You read these early these chapters of the earlier history before the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity, and you read of King Ahaz, an ungodly, wicked king who brought a pagan altar into the temple. King Manasseh later put idols in the temple. In Babylon, Ezekiel was given a vision of activity back in Jerusalem in the temple. It was full of carved images. The elders of Israel were leading the, the, the congregation in pagan worship, and the women were weeping for Tammuz. All of that would have been in the, the, the recent memory of God's people. So here, the, the psalmist reminded the people they were to be holy. They were to be separated from the surrounding world in their thinking and their activity. Not in their witness. They were to be a light to the nations. But in their behavior, their thinking, they were to be holy, separate, different from the nations. God is holy. He's pure and good. So where He is must be holy. And since we are now His house... Paul speaks of us that way as being his temple in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Since we are his temple, we are to be holy. This was a concern of the law of Moses. This was a concern of the apostles. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. So, I think we could interpret or apply, holiness befits your house as holiness is appropriate for His people. It's appropriate for us. Anxiety is not holiness. It is a lack of, of faith in the Lord and His Word. The, the world is um, alarmed about everything. It's alarmed about the population, about the environment, about the future. We are to be wise but calm. Why? Because the Lord reigns. That's the comfort of providence. Calvin wrote of that early in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. I've periodically referred to this passage. It's uh, quite an excellent passage in my opinion. He, he wrote that if we, we took into consideration the, the dangers in the world could really reflect deeply on all the different problems out there, potential danger for us. We would never leave our houses. Innumerable are the deaths that threaten us from disease to dangers in the streets or fierce animals we may see. Even our house is no refuge. It can catch fire in the day or collapse on us at night. We live as if a sword were perpetually hanging over our necks. Yet, he wrote, when the light of divine providence has once shone upon a godly man, he is then relieved and set free not only from the extreme anxiety and, anxiety and fear that were pressing him before, but, but also from every care of life. His solace, I say, is to know that his heavenly Father so holds in his power, so rules by his authority and will, so governs by his wisdom, that nothing can befall except he determine it. And if he determines it, it's for our good. 
And we have to understand that. We may not understand it at the moment, but it's true. Everything works in His providence and will for our good and His glory. Well, that's Psalm 93. The Lord reigns, and that gives confidence to entrust ourselves to the Lord's sovereign care and go out of our houses every day in obedience to the Lord and conduct our lives with joy and freedom to be holy. If this world is firmly established and cannot be destroyed by man-made disasters, then neither can just one of God's saints be destroyed by that. He's numbered our days, and they are firmly established. George Whitfield, the great evangelist, his life was an example of that. His life was in continual danger. He crossed the Atlantic in wooden ships 13 times to preach the gospel. Like Paul, he could have written, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea. But he wrote in his journal in 1756, I find that we are immortal till our work is done. That's Pauline theology. That's Psalm 93. Indeed, the world is firmly established, and so are the saints. The sovereignty of God is eminently practical. It gives confidence in chaos. It produces love and obedience, which is holiness. That's what is required of us. Holiness befits your house. Think of that as cleanness, moral, spiritual cleanness. Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones was one of the great preachers of the mid-20th century, an amazing man. He's, he's called Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones because he's a medical doctor, not a, theological, uh, man, a man with a theological PhD. He was trained in medicine, but it was a brilliant an insightful preacher. For 30 years, he preached in Westminster Chapel, London. Before that, he preached in a small congregation in Wales. He told an interesting story that occurred in those, those early years. There was in the town a woman who was a medium. She made contact with spirits and the dead, whatever. She was employed by a spiritist society which she would go to every Sunday evening where she was well paid, paid a large sum to act as the medium. Well, one Sunday she wasn't able to make her appointment. Out her window she saw people passing by on their way to church and something made her feel a, a desire to know what the people had. So she decided to go to the service, and did so. She came every Sunday after that, until she died, and became what Lloyd-Jones called a very fine Christian. But one day he asked her what she had felt on that first visit. She said, the moment I entered your chapel and sat down on a seat amongst the people, I was conscious of a power I was conscious of the same sort of power I was accustomed to in our spiritist meeting, but there was a big difference. I had a feeling that the power in your chapel was a clean power. In other words, she sensed something holy among those people who had gathered to worship God in spirit and truth. And that should be the church today. That should be us here Holiness befits your house, and holiness radiates, and it affects those around us, and it exhibits itself in love and warmth. And so are we that kind of a people? It's one of my prayers for us, that we would love the Lord, that we love His Word and gather for that, and that we love one another. And that when a stranger comes in here, such as that woman, she would sense a difference. She would sense this is a warm, welcoming, loving place. That's a holy congregation. 
The Lord is true, the Lord is pure, and the Lord is eternal. The psalm ends, O Lord, forevermore. Psalm 23 ends with the same Hebrew words. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That too is encouragement to holiness, to a spiritually clean environment and to perseverance in it. The Lord is eternal. So is our future. The world is passing away, but our future is eternal. Earlier I mentioned Isaiah 6, the chapter that records Isaiah's calling as to be a prophet and his vision there. The chapter begins, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now why would he say that? Why does he give us that date? Well, because King Uzziah was a godly king. He had a failure at the end of his life. But his reign had been brilliant and blessed of God. The chronicler wrote, He was marvelously helped until he was strong. And when he became strong, he became proud. And he entered the temple to burn incense, which was the prerogative only of the priest. And the Lord struck him with leprosy. The best of men fail. He reigned 52 years. When he died, a young Isaiah wondered, what now? This great king is gone. He was anxious when he went to the temple and he saw the Lord on his throne, lofty and exalted. He's always on his throne. In the weal and woe of life, in the happy times and the hard times, the Lord reigns. We must never forget that. It gives stability to us now and it gives hope for the future. Today, creation is subject to futility, but that will change. When Christ returns, it will be set free to glory Regenerated, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 29, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you have that hope and confidence now? And for the future? Hope is found only in Christ, who is both Lord and Savior, the eternal Son of God, who became a man to die for sinners. If you are in unbelief, realize the hopelessness of your life, the brevity and futility of life. As the psalmist said, soon it is gone and we fly away. That was Moses who said that, who lived to be 120 years old, over in a moment. Look to Christ, believe in Him. Receive from His Father forgiveness and eternal life, then rest in Him and live for Him. Live for what lasts, knowing that the Lord reigns forever. Well, let us stand and sing praise to the Lord with hymn number 10 in the songs of praise. All praise to Him. Hymn number 10, and then we'll close in a benediction. Father, we do praise you for what we have just sung, that you you even bend your ear to hear our prayers of praise and requests for help, and you hear and you answer. And we praise you, Lord, for the all-sufficient sacrifice that your Son made for your people. It's finished. There's nothing we can add to it. It's finished for all eternity. While we may fail, that sacrifice never fails. It is atoned for all of our sins, and we are righteous in your sight. Lord, that is not an excuse we know to sin. It is an incentive to be holy. And may we be that. May we serve you in any way, in every way. Make this congregation, 
a holy congregation that loves you and seeks your will and expresses that to everyone present here. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace in Christ's name. Amen.